From the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a film review for you. Today, I'll be reviewing the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, released in 1968, featuring Care Doulet, Gary Lockwood, and William Sylvester, directed by Stanley Kubrick. The synopsis is, this film is a grouping of short stories that lead to the evolution of man into a super being star child. The story. Director Stanley Kubrick contacted Arthur C. Clarke about making a science fiction movie and Clarke suggested a story he did in 1948, The Sentinel, written for a BBC competition about finding an alien artifact on the moon. They both wrote the screenplay in 58 days, but at the same time, Clarke worked on the book that was released a little bit after the film as not to confuse initial audiences and give away any surprises. Stanley Kubrick acknowledged the influence of Conquest of Space, released in 1955, citing what life would be like in space, a vast vision of space travel, and it even has a very similar looking rotating space station demonstrating the precision of man's design. For many people, this film is really confusing and lacks a lot of luster upon first viewing. But to their credit, Arthur C. Clarke once said, if you understand 2001 completely, we failed. We wanted to raise far more questions than we answered. So if you're a little bit confused by the story, that's exactly what the filmmakers intended to do. At 2 hours and 29 minutes, <laughs> to be very, very honest, the pacing is awful. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you can patiently watch this film, you may come to appreciate what the scenes are really doing. By, by having these long extended time periods showing every detail of the process, it's kind of showing off the special effects and it's also showing you the passage of time, therefore putting you right in the middle of the story. The Challenge the challenge in this film is often non-distinct and for much of this film it's really up to your own interpretation. At first you may think that the challenge is the appearance of this mysterious black rectangular structure that appears out of nowhere. And it's referred to as the monolith in the book, but the film never really names this particular obstruction. It's just never explained. Every time the monolith appears, something evolutionary happens and we aren't told if it's causing it or simply observing it. Actually, <laughs> I have this kind of weird thought process that I kind of think that the monolith is, is sort of a portal to transport programming in, in the form of sounds. And, and you hear that when the monolith emits sort of like this weird sound that it has. It's really interesting. It's disorienting and very disturbing to the audience. I think that the aliens controlling the monolith are striving to advance man to the point that they can eventually communicate with us. In the story, there are four distinct acts surrounding the monolith's influence in the story. At first, the monolith gives birth to the ape man and helps him figure out how to use tools in order to master his world and then leads the evolved ape man to a stargate at Jupiter. The outright memorable villain in the film appears in the third act of the film in the form of HAL 9000, a spaceship computer used in the mission to Jupiter. 
HAL is a heuristically programmed algorithm computer, and according to the film, the most reliable computer ever made, and refers to himself as a conscious entity. There's an actual error in his programming that makes him report a false malfunction during the mission. And this paradox actually pushes how to react irrationally and even resorting to self-preservation. He's quite a very memorable villain because he's quite understated in his demeanor at the beginning of the film when all of the humans really trust him. Um, they really have no fear of him because you know he is basically controlling the entire ship and they depend on him for so much. It, it kind of really makes you feel awful just seeing him coldly kill off all the members of the crew. It's just quite chilling but he is quite a fantastic and memorable villain. The Empathy The Empathy is strange because there's so many characters in the film that you really don't get attached to any of them until the very end. The Ape Man in the beginning of the film fights animals for food and other apes for food and even becomes food to the predators in the area. The leader of the ape men is called the Moon Watcher. And when this strange monolith shows up, Moon Watcher is the one who takes the most action. Seeing common objects now around him, such as animal bones, as a tool that can kill for food and protect its turf against other ape men and defeat its predators. It's very interesting how that mind shift really affects him and his tribe. Now there's a, a very infamous transition into the next sequence of humankind in the film where the bone tool of the ape man is thrown into the air and then compared to satellites in orbit around the earth thousands of years later. I thought that that was such a beautiful and, and poignant moment as well as I'm sure everyone who saw it because it's been talked about so much in cinema appreciation. Now, the second story follows Dr. Haywood Floyd, who is on the way to the moon to investigate the appearance of a 40 million year old monolith buried 40 feet underneath the surface of the dark side of the moon. We get to know a little bit about his life as a father and a scientist, but we don't get to know any hints about his actual character, his personality. Uh, so I, I believe in this story, his particular appearance in it is only meant to set up the next story. Now the monolith emits this really high-pitched, annoying sound, which is actually a radio emission aimed at Jupiter. The humans believe that it's a rendezvous point to meet and discover other life forms in the universe. And then the next story segment begins about 18 months later where a team is sent to Jupiter on a very top secret mission. Three of the team members are in hibernation until their services are needed and two other team members, Dr. David Bowman and Dr. Frank Poole, who are in charge of overseeing the travels. So, it's just so very interesting that we have this computer that it exhibits all of these human qualities, Hal, showing the desire to want to live, even begging for his life at, at the end of the film. And then we have these humans that are so cold and barely able to acknowledge each other. I'll give you a really good example. Uh, it's Frank's birthday and his dad manages to get him a pay raise. 
And Frank's reaction to it is very lackluster. He's not very excited about it, it seems. He's just, it's just another thing to him. It's almost as if the film was, is, is commenting that the, the evolutionary growth of man actually removes a lot of his emotional state. Because there's no emotional connection in the humans, you know, the, the audience isn't really upset when, when some of them die, especially Frank. I, 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 of course, it was sad to see that his character dies, but it, it didn't break my heart, you know? And, and I think it's because Frank is just not super likable and relatable. And David Bowman seems to be slightly upset when he discovers that Frank is killed, but he isn't broken up about it either. Of course, he cares, but he doesn't really show emotion. He, he just sets into his mission to disconnect Hal and gain control over the ship again, using yet another tool, the screwdriver. David becomes a hero in all of this, so he is probably the one person in this whole film that you actually connect to in a way. Even though he doesn't display a whole bunch of emotions, you, you do root for him as he's struggling to survive against Hal. And, and yes, we don't know much about David, but most of us share a universal desire to want to survive. Now the technical aspects. Stanley Kubrick involved himself in every aspect of the production and consulted the best science experts of the time that the film predicted the invention of the iPad, Skype, voice recognition, utilizing computers to manage daily life, and artificial companionship. One of the most notable effects of the film are the scenes in space and how according to what we really know about space today, it all seems very accurate. In fact, the effects are so good that people have wondered for years whether or not the first moon landing was real and if it had been staged by Kubrick himself. The film was made nine years before Star Wars and it was the first believable space voyage depicted on screen. It's just simply gorgeous and still holds up today. Having calculated that it would take one person 13 years to hand draw and paint all the mats needed to create the starry space backgrounds, Kubrick then hired 13 people who did the job in one year. Filming the special effects shots took 18 months and it looks it on screen. Rather than using blue screen, Stanley Kubrick filmed all the model shots against black backgrounds and required the compositing work to be done by a team of British animators painting traveling mats by hand, frame by frame to mask out each element. The film's spaceships were models that were made from wood, fiberglass, plexiglass, steel, brass, and aluminum. The fine details made it possible for cameras to get as close to the models as possible with no loss of believability. And you can really see that the film is showing off all of that detail. To create the space travel at the film's climax, Douglas Trumbull combined aerial footage from Monument Valley, Utah, shot through colored filters with other aerial shots originally made for Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strainlove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, made in 1964. He also invented a split scan effect by keeping the camera shutter open to expose single frames of film while he moved the light source towards the camera to create this fantastic pattern of lights. Now the soundtrack is specifically impressive in this film. It's been raved about so much 
But what a lot of people don't know is that the legendary soundtrack from George Leggetti was actually used without Leggetti's permission. And the composer did not find out about it until he attended the movie's Vienna premiere. Of course, Leggetti sued. However, the music is an outstanding feature in the film, proclaiming many moods of grandeur during the storytelling. The performances. The performances are great, but the only actor you actually get to get close to is Kier Dulé, who plays Dr. David Bowman, and he played it well being a very logical and matter-of-fact stoic hero. The best part of the film. For me, uh, that would be the Stargate, and <laughs> I think that was notoriously one of the favorite parts of the film for a lot of people because of the visual stimulation. I, I probably could watch that scene for hours and hours to be completely honest. It's so hypnotic and I just love it. My wish list. I'm not sure that I would wish for anything because that would change the value in this film. So I think I'm going to digress in this section. You know, even the pacing as bad as it is, it's part of the reason why the film has so much gravity. Everything is so slow and and you do feel like you're actually experiencing things in real time. It has its charm about it and it's a specific way of storytelling that I feel is intrinsic to the, the message in the film. Now the ending. The ending is nothing short of imaginative and inspirational. It's kind of a surprise at the end. It's also very uh, hypnotic and, and interesting. To recap what happens, at the rendezvous point in Jupiter space, the monolith appears and the stargate opens. The film doesn't tell you that it's a stargate. We get that information from the book that was written and some of the language used to describe scenes in the film by the filmmakers. So many people who saw this movie back in 1968 had no idea what was happening. So without explanation, this whole thing just seems so disjointed. Now the Stargate is used to take David from one part of the universe to another part of the universe to the alien planet, which we kind of get to see a little bit of, of the, the landscape. Once he's on the alien world, he's placed in this kind of luxury holding cell. It's, it's gorgeous. It looks like a beautiful hotel room and this is the place where the aliens can observe David and even program him more. You can hear many sounds like animal grunts, humming, strange noises of alien languages perhaps. It's uncertain what they are but these little details are just full of really fascinating nuggets that you could kind of sculpt your own story. You can imagine what they're saying and just wonder what's really going on here. The imagination can go just about anywhere. And so the, the monolith also appears to David at his deathbed. He's, he sheds his human body and he becomes the star child. And at the very end, we have the scene where the star child is is opposite earth maybe observing it or you know sent to dominate it we don't know <laughs> and, and so it leaves the audience with so many questions enjoyment i really really love this film a lot i mean is it one of my favorite films of all time not really. <laughs> it is though. It's really, it's one of those films that I really enjoy seeing. But because it's so long, I like hesitate a little bit. But I really do appreciate all of the art and the craft, the genius, and 
and amazing features that this film accomplished in its day and how it still impacts us today. It, it's, it's a gorgeous film and it's definitely one of those films that you just simply must see at least once. Stanley Kubrick definitely had a style and a vision for composition framing these great moments in this film with music, anticipation, visuals, and many technical risks that no one had ever seen before done so well. And the cool thing is that I believe that this film is itself a monolith, raising many questions and inspiring its viewers. My rating is a 9. Well, that sums up my review. I hoped you liked it. It's Retro Nerd Girls signing off. Take care, movie lovers. I'm off to my next review.